Thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Kevin McDermott. I'm a content strategist with Booz Allen Hamilton. And I'm Dana Solano. I'm a user experience lead also with Booz Allen Hamilton. Um, and for the last couple of years, Dana and I have been working on um, some website redesign projects for the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases uh, at NIH. Um, and so we are going to talk about uh, content strategy and user experience um, and how those uh, two, uh, two professions kind of combine uh, to create a superpowered IA. Um, before we start, I kind of wanted to get a sense of the crowd. How many folks consider themselves content strategists or do the work of a content strategist? Okay. How about uh, folks who consider themselves user experience professionals? Okay. See some hands that are both, which is good. Um, how about just any developers in the audience? Excellent. Okay. Great. We've got a great mix of people. Um, so I guess we can jump right in. Yeah. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to talk about content strategy. Uh, and the way we kind of um, are looking at this, the way we sort of worked on our projects is I, I take content strategy and I, I consider it looking at it from the ground up. So you're looking at that page level um, information. Um, you're kind of seeing the trees instead of the forest. Um, and uh, some of the tools and methodologies that we use uh, to be able to do that is we create content inventories that reveals all the content on the site. Um, we go in and we do perform content audits, which is getting really into that page level content and um, finding out whether the content is relevant, is it, if it's in the right place and we consolidate it. Um, we deal with things like taxonomy, which helps us uh, order the content and organize it and structure it a little bit better. Um, and then we deal with things like content types, which is how we sort of get these content, um, these pieces of content into the content management system, Drupal in this case, um, and uh, you know, we get it out to the, uh, to the audience. Whereas I'm looking at the user experience side of things, which is from the top down. And that's we're starting with um, what users need, what they want, and we're not so concerned, at least at the beginning, with what the website is today or what kind of content we already have. Um, so the things that I'm looking at is, uh, first of all, I conduct user research efforts to kind of figure out who the users are, who even wants to use our site, what are they trying to use it for, um, those kinds of efforts. But specifically um, related to building out an IA, these are um, some of the activities that I carry out. Uh, there's a card sort, um, which is kind of getting language and ideas for groupings from people. Tree testing, which is validating ideas for kind of the structure of your information architecture. Design, which is bringing that all together with wireframes and mockups. And then usability testing. We'll get into each uh, of these areas in a little bit more detail going forward, but that's a basic overview. Yep. And uh, it all comes together with our information architecture. Um, because you're all at Drupal GovCon, I'm going to go out on a limb and say most of you have informational websites. So it means one of your biggest challenges is likely the findability of your content. And information architecture is more than just your navigation structure. It's the connections between everything that's there. And so it speaks to everything from navigation to taxonomy to related content. When does everybody get opportunities to find other content you have? And so all of these activities are related to building out a complete information architecture. We're going to suggest a lot of different methods here, and you will see that this is quite an in-depth process, but we think it's worth doing. And it's because there are so many benefits to validating an information architecture before you try and hand it off to development teams. One of the goals of this is to come up with an idea and validate it with real users before you try and make your developers build it. You also want to make sure that you can repeat that process time and time again. Every time you need to do a new navigation or information architecture process, you should be able to follow the same thing and get a, know you're going to get a great result. So we're going to stop, start off with establishing a baseline. Yep. And I wanted to touch base a little bit on what Dana was saying um, about uh, why we're doing this, why we're creating an IA. I'm assuming that uh, majority, if not all, folks here are working on government websites, and there are thousands and thousands of pieces of content on those websites. And a lot of times, that content has grown organically over uh, a decade or more. Um, and so, you really need to kind of get in there and start looking at um, looking at the structure. And and every once in a while, just kind of making sure everything is where it's supposed to be, that the content is important, that, that people can find it, like Dana said. So, or sometimes it shouldn't be anywhere. Sure. <laughs> That's, that's true too, the, the, the big purge, which we'll talk about. Um, so uh, the first thing I want to talk about is the content inventory. This is the, the master tool for the content strategist. Um, 
a lot of, you know, Drupal's developing a lot of modules that, that will actually allow you to do this within the content management system, perform, uh, to create an inventory to perform audits. Um, but I like to use the, the good old fashioned Excel spreadsheet. Um, it's uh, a really easy tool, not just to capture all the pieces of content uh, in one place, but you can um, start to create little sub tools out of this. So the content inventory is really going to be an organic, uh, an organic document and a multi-purpose tool. So it's gonna grow throughout this entire process. Um, so it's gonna start a very simple list um, and then uh, you can just kind of add all different kinds of data to sort of manipulate this, manipulate this content and use Excel to do that and then create individual worksheets that you can uh, use to move forward with the migration process um, and to uh, use a sort of like a historical tool of what you did during that migration as well. So it's a really valuable, uh, valuable tool. Um, so you can see the, the very basics of the content inventory is uh, you're gonna get an extract and any content management system should be able to do this. It's an extract of all the, uh, all the pieces of content on the site, uh, HTML pages, uh, documents like Word or PDFs that might be attached, um, images, those sorts of things. Um, so you're gonna have them all in one big, big spreadsheet. Um, now, again, we're working with large informational sites in most cases, so uh, a single just list of things won't really be that useful to you. So you have to then start building out this content in the um, Again, most content management systems will also be able to extract pieces of metadata. Uh, associated with that content. So you want to pull into the content inventory anything that uh, might be useful in sort of identifying this content, um, giving you a sense of what it might be. So title and description are definitely very useful. Um, things like page types, um, uh, uh, owners, content owners, things like that. Um, uh, you can even pull things like Google Analytics if you have Google Analytics set up with your site. Pull that into the content inventory and find out how many times the page is reviewed. Uh, bounce rates, those sorts of things. So, that's the kind of data from the that I look at when I look at the content inventory. It's really easy for me to find like what are the most viewed pages. Um, we add our own metadata about intended audiences sometimes to even see if it's writing to any of the targeted audiences for our sites or if it's writing to too many. Um, and all of that information helps uh, me gauge which content might be the highest value. Yep. So it's a tool that we kind of share. Um, and I, I just wanted to apologize, I know that, that previous slide was, you're not really going to be able to see all these cells, so I've got some slides where I'm um, just focusing on different areas. So um, the entire inventory, once you have it all laid out, can be you know, many, many columns long, um, and uh, a lot of times you'll just have to hide things or, or expand um, just to be able to, to kind of work with it all. But, um, but so these are some of the, the, the things that we do. Um, we're going to break the content inventory down even more later on. Uh, one of the things that you do want to do that I do with every content inventory um, is create a unique uh, identifier. This content is going to move um, throughout the course of this process. So uh, it's going to get broken up. It's going to be put in a different location. So you want to have that unique identifier to sort of know where it came from originally um, and um, you know, just have that as, as something so you can identify that content as it moves along. Um, the columns that you add as a content strategist uh, are really going to depend on what, what you're trying to do. So in this case, we're trying to build the IA, but um, again, you're going to be using this tool and you might be handing this tool off to developers, you might be handing it off to the user experience professional, you might be handing it off to stakeholders. So you want to kind of include a little bit of something in there for everyone. Um, and you can then sort of extract the columns that you want, uh, just the pieces of content that you want, if you do need to do that handoff so that somebody can take a look at it and it's not going to be as overwhelming as, as what you got. And the next step, once we kind of have the content inventory, I start to get a sense of maybe like what's going to be the highest level of navigation or what's the most important content or which one seems like uh, it seems the least clear about how things should be organized in group. Uh, that's when I run a card sort. So this is um, an example, or two examples rather, of different ways you can run a card sort. I will mostly be showing screenshots of this tool that's on, this, on the right, which is an unmoderated, although you can use it for moderated tests, it is a remote card sort tool. But as long as you have note cards and a pen, you can run a card sort. Um, there are also um, Excel spreadsheets that are freely available online that'll help you analyze this data, even if you're doing it in a more freeform fashion. But um, for these purposes, I'm gonna be showing this tool on the right, which is called Optimal Sort, um, which is part of the Alt Optimal Workshop. <laughs> and the way that a card sort works, no matter if it's 
digital or in person, is that you ask a participant to um, group descriptions you have written about content and put them into logical groups that make sense to them and label those groups. So I'm going to give an example um, from the work we've done at NIAD. Uh, we are looking at their intranet website right now. Um, this picture that you see on the left there is the Browse by Topics page. There are a lot of links. and um, and not everything was necessarily speaking to users. We had actually run usability testing on the existing system with new employees and had seen some problem areas already. So we knew we wanted to reconstruct this section. Um, so we, uh, we looked at what was there. We took away all the page titles, replaced them with descriptions along with removing all the acronyms, removing all the branding, um, removing duplicate keywords so people wouldn't be tempted to group stuff together just because the word... Uh, you know, loss or whatever uh, appeared in it. And then we ran it as an open card tour. So what we got out of that is a common architecture. Um, so on the left, you can see what we originally had as a selection of groupings. And on the right, this was the most common architecture created by people. So some of the big differences for us in terms of uh, how they organized it one was that uh, human resources had been a single group because it was one department that managed it, but when end users actually had to organize the content for themselves, they thought of it as pay and leave, professional development, uh, sort of work-life balance and recreational activities. Um, and, but you can see that still only 20 out of 72 people use this architecture, so that doesn't mean we're all the way there, but it means we're on a good start. Um, another piece of, uh, I guess, information we get out of the card sort is ideas for where we want to have crosslinks. So this is an example of looking at the individual card data. Um, we had a card that specifically spoke to if you forgot your badge, and most people associated it with building information, but there was a subset of people who associated it with an information technology category. And it's because it's their like PIV card security badge, they felt like they had to go to IT if they needed help with that. And so this is the kind of information where you're like, well, I know it should live under building information, but there might be um, related content on the IT page that also uh, lets people know that this is available. Yep, and you, dealing with related content, well, it, it, it ties a lot into taxonomy, which we're gonna talk about later, um, and we'll show you how we kind of uh, deal with this on the, on the content inventory as well. Yeah, and you're definitely gonna end up with some uh, cards and groupings that you don't expect either, and it's always valuable to kind of see these. For example, um, we had several people create categories kind of like this, not a significant number. This is a category just called, I lost it. Anything that's related to them losing items, they put into a single category. This is definitely not something you would um, ever think of as an organizational um, structure if you were looking at it from your organization structure, but it's a way that users think about it. And it's important to know that. So um, this is an example of kind of what we create once we bring these two things together. I have the information on how people uh, think it should be grouped and also what labels they would put on top of those groups. So the language that they're using to get those items. Um, we're then running that against the content inventory and we use it to create our draft navigation structure. That is typically communicated as a hierarchy, as you can see here. Partially um, that's because of the tool we want to use next. But um, this, is a, this is a very helpful tool in kind of getting that first step towards the navigation structure. The broader IA is something we end up documenting a little bit later. Yep. And this is really helpful for me as a content strategist. So what Dana's done is she's taken some of the content from that inventory and from you know, the current site, and then she's done this first validation process of it, and then created this, this, uh, this navigation structure, um, which I'm gonna go in then back to the content inventory as I always do, and uh, start breaking things up into even smaller chunks. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, I think it's interesting that, and uh, the building information, mm -hmm. that the addresses are in parallel with more generalized topics, badging and security, visitor services and information, uh, as opposed to... Was it on this slide? Next, no, the next one. Oh, it was, uh, was on the next one? Yeah, right at the bottom there. So ah. we've got 5601 mm -hmm. Fishers Lane, Rocky Mountain, NIH Green Campus, badging and security, visitor services information, cafeteria menu are sort of in a parallel in 
the navigation. I find that interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was one of the things that we are thinking about for the internet website is a flatter navigation structure because we, um, the more levels you have, the more difficulty people were having in finding that information. Mm -hmm. And so um, we started toying around with wireframes and we did create a visual differentiator in between the addresses and the content okay. below. But as a structural level, we want it to all live in the same place. We actually want a lot of these pages to make reuse of the same content because you don't know that someone's gonna try and get to the building security information from the building itself or a general page about the building information. But if you have redundant content, you got another problem on your hands. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay. So um, once, once we've done that, once we've validated that, I'm gonna be able to break up this content inventory into, into something more manageable. So one of the big struggles is um, we've got all this content, some of it's not even visible you know, through, the, through the current navigation. Uh, and all of it kind of has to be reviewed and, and checked out. So a content inventory that's just you know, a big blob of content is not going to be very, very easy to use. So what I'll do is I'll take that level one information that Dana created in the, in the, draft, um, in the draft navigation and I'll just create tabs and I'll pull the content into these different tabs. So now you've broken it up a little bit better. Um, and then the next step is I take that draft navigation and I start creating navigation columns um, and create those lower levels there. Um, so now I'm able to break these up into smaller chunks I'm able to review the content uh, on a much more granular level um, that's within the current structure and really find out if that content um, belongs where it is right now. If all of these things that we have grouped based on sort of the way things are now um, really should be there. So, um, so we're really breaking it down and, and this is just you know, one more step into getting us to sort of more manageable chunks that, that we, can, uh, we can analyze a little bit. Yeah, and so now that we're getting to analysis, um, We'll start off by talking about the content audit. So the content audit is really the most time-consuming part of uh, being a content strategist. Like I said, there's, there's content in there that you need to review, and, and ideally you want to go through page by page and look at every piece of content. Um, so the content audit can be many different things, and, and realistically, it's going to depend on the scope of your project, like how much content you're looking at um, versus how much time you actually have. So if you're dealing with a really large project, the content audit might just be you're looking at the content and you're saying, does this content belong with uh, the rest of the content in this section? Uh, if yes, great. If no, where should it go? Um, one of the validation things that I do here um, with, the, uh, with the current um, draft navigation is I determine if everything kind of fits in these, in these buckets that Bing has created. Um, if it does, um, you know, we group them all together. If it doesn't, sometimes there's these orphan uh, pieces of content, and we either have to say, does this content really belong in the site? Um, does it, um, you know, does it does it need its own category uh, within the information architecture? Um, is this something that just should be, you know, archived and gotten rid of? Um, so if you're doing a, a big project, uh, you're going to kind of have to go at that high level. If you have the opportunity, and this content audit spreadsheet was something that we worked, we created this tool um, when we had an opportunity to look at a very small section of content. Uh, and we looked at everything from, um, you know, is it, is it uh, where it needs to be in the navigation? Um, but then we also got into like more detail, like um, is, the, uh, you know, is the content quality up to the standards of the site? Um, are the labels clear? Uh, you know, is, the, um, you know uh, is there a proper use of images and videos on that page? Um, and we were able to sort of rate these pages and then uh, get into them a little bit more. But really this audit is making sure that um, you have good content on the site. And because as Dana says, no one's gonna be searching for bad content. So uh, you wanna get into each page on that individual level and um, kind of do that comparing and validating this, this draft navigation so that we can move on to the next step. Well, and so um, we actually have introduced a new uh, piece into our process recently talking about do labels make sense, uh, which is the label evaluation framework. Um, so when we take our draft navigation map, we create these columns that uh, we put rating scores on them to kind of just get a feel for if we think the labels are where they need to be, particularly if this is like going to represent your global navigation or, or something to that effect that's going to be highly visible. So you can just see across the top, specific, concise, uh, what is it, comprehensive, comprehensive, transparent, familiar, and front-loaded. So this isn't necessarily something that uh, 
that we need to get a 100% score before we're gonna validate it. If it works for the users, it works for the users, but this gives us an idea of what are our potential problem areas. And once we feel like our draft navigation is in a good place, we're gonna put that into um, a tool known as TreeJack, which allows us to run what's called a tree test. Um, the image that's on the left shows you what a user sees. They see a hierarchical structure, one level at a time, and they're given a task, just like you would get in a usability test, and they are asked to click through the structure um, in order to say, I'd find the content in this location or under this item. And what we get on the back end is some amazing graphics and data about those scenarios. I will get into the details with an example. Um, so this is again from our intranet study. We had a scenario related to participants locating telework information. Because HR had previously been the owner of this content, it was living in a section that was related uh, to that area. And so this is the result from the uh, first item. So you have a success rate of 69%, uh, of but only 24 are directly going to it. That means that they did not make any detours. They went directly to that. That's a really, really low number. Um, and so uh, we also had people taking about 30 seconds to get there, um, which has very much uh, a lot to do with the uh, non-directness of the path. So we made some changes to move it around and um, into a new section that had a little bit more visibility, was more related to, um, there was also like a network access section. We brought it out out of there, but we created this work location section that included all of the offices plus telework. So that raised the scenario. And now you can see the, uh, the direct success rate has risen. Um, so I mean, it's uh, closer into the 40s and we also have a higher success rate of 80% overall. And um, the other amazing graphic that I had shown at the beginning, this is one of my favorite things about tree uh, TreeJack, this is the pie tree. One of the things that we use to help us identify problems is this graphic. So um, wherever you see the green is a correct path that it could have taken. Yellow represents the uh, correct options that could have been selected. Blue is a incorrect path that someone chose but turned around and red is somebody went down an incorrect path and made the incorrect choice. So we can see that in our first tree test we had an area called work areas and tools and it was a huge red herring in this scenario that people often got confused. But when we removed that category, oops, and my animation is not working. Um, <laughs> outstanding. Uh, we did much better the second time. Um, we, didn't, uh, we no longer had that red herring title. We replaced it with an area called job portals. Um, and so uh, we were able to get people directly to where they needed to go without them taking this detour into this work areas and tools. Dana gets to work with all these cool tools and have these <laughs> cool graphics and present. I get to work with spreadsheets that no one ever reads. I know that no one ever reads them, but uh, so be it. Yeah, speaking of which, so once we've kind of validated some of these items, um, this is actually one of Kevin's favorite uh, artifacts of the ones that I create. This is our detailed information architecture map. Again, we have a lot of colors and shapes that represent different things that are going on. Um, so this is not only alluding to our navigation structure, but um, white items are not in the navigation. Uh, we have uh, links without a box, our contextual. Um, we also have that weird shape up there, with, even though that's not on the legend. What that represents is content we recommend is created based on, like, people might group a whole bunch of cards together and call it something. We're like, you know what would be great if we just had one page that spoke to that item? Mm -hmm. So um, kind of those things uh, are represented here. And we actually do the entire higher information architecture. This does everything. So this is showing a small part of this diagram. This was uh, when we printed it out on 11 by 17 with an eight point font. I think this was seven pages long. Yeah, you stretched that <laughs> across the room. And, and this, is, this, this points out, I mean, like I said, I'm a very visual person. A lot of people that you're gonna be working with are visual people. When I hand them a spreadsheet, they look at it and their, their eyes gloss over. But if you can show them sort of the content in, in a presentation like this, it's really helpful to people. It helps them sort of digest it. Like these, these um, white boxes gets down into the more detailed, like sometimes even on the very page level. Um, so it's very helpful to me, and I know it's very helpful to some of the people that we show it to, uh, and it helps them kind of, you know, literally paint a picture of what, uh, of what the content's gonna look like on the site. 
So back to the spreadsheets. Um, so again, so Dana's done the, the tree test now. She did, she did the, the card sort. That is two levels of sort of validation about we really think this is how users are looking for content and where they think it would be. Um, I've got my nice visual where I can see the content. So I go back in and I take that, that navigation map and I, uh, I add it back to the, uh, to the content inventory. Um, so it validates for me whether that navigation that I created, those navigation columns, are correct. Um, and then it helps me go back in, and again, I'm, I'm doing this page by page level um, assessment of this content to determine whether it really belongs in these buckets. Um, now I start creating my migration uh, migration section. Go back. No, oh, sorry. I start creating my migration section. So this is going to become a tool when you do start moving content around, uh, and, it, and it's a really useful one. So if uh, something used to be uh, in a certain place and you determine, no, it actually belongs somewhere else, whether that be from the cart sort or from the content analysis and the content audit, um, we uh, identify that in the migration document. So, uh, and then again, anyone who's ever worked with Excel knows that you can um, sort of sort and filter things so um, you can pull out pieces of the content when you're migrating and, and much more easily um, move forward with them and, and get them to where they need to be. Uh, the next piece is taxonomy. We touched on a little bit on this a little bit um, when we were talking about related content. So, uh, a lot of times you might have content that is in um, that belongs in different sections of the site. So you validated that it, it does belong, but it's also very much related. So you might have something in um, you know, one section of the site that is you know, uh, very closely related to something in another section. So taxonomy helps you uh, sort of pull those two pieces of content together. And Drupal is very good um, with uh, being able to take individual pieces of content uh, from different locations on the site and pull them into a single place. Um, we'll get into a little bit more when we start talking about the page structure itself, which is the next section. Um, but you can actually pull snippets of content from different locations and create, uh, create a page that has, um, you know, that people can kind of mix and match what they need using that taxonomy. So just one more column or set of columns that you, uh, that you add to the spreadsheet. You create these, content, or you create these taxonomy categories uh, and then add the different tags that you would tag it in. And um, so you can see in this case, um, one of the categories was diseases. Uh, and we had, um, you know, we would have content for the NIAID project um, about, you know, the research that's being done on HIV AIDS. Uh, there was also a section of the site uh, that dealt with funding opportunities, and there was content that was funding opportunities just for HIV AIDS. There was a section of the site uh, that dealt with clinical trials, and if there was any clinical trials going on about HIV AIDS. All these pieces of content belonged where they were, but if you were a researcher coming and you wanted to know everything about HIV AIDS, we could pull all that content together using the taxonomy. So uh, what we do is tag it, and that then helps uh, the migration uh, folks um, put that tag into Drupal. It helps the developers uh, create these, these taxonomy categories, and ultimately it's going to help the users find the content that they need. And so now we get to the stage where we're actually trying to start building stuff out. And um, and when we say building stuff out, we're actually talking about what leads to development. It is uh, some of our uh, big deliverables. So for content. So the content entry form, uh, as I was just talking about how Drupal can pull content from different places, um, we wanted to give folks uh, a sense of uh, how that would look before, they actually, uh, before it actually went, um, went live. So uh, we created basically these, these content entry forms, which are essentially just Word documents. Um, a lot of content owners and um, you know, subject matter experts, they're used to working in Word. Uh, and if you kind of sort of, it, you can give them something that they're familiar with, it's a little bit helpful. So all it is is a Word document, but we set up these sort of content chunks to identify uh, the different blocks of content that we want to pull from different locations. Uh, and it gives them a good visual. We actually pull in real content so that, you know, if you're talking about radically rearranging how the content is presented, um, you can show folks you know, in a real in a real way, what that would look like, how it's related, um, and it also helps folks sort of understand uh, the structures. So we're able to, to block off content um, into into these small bite-sized pieces that that a lot of studies have shown that users are really interested in, in you know consuming things in, in much smaller much smaller chunks. Um, and then, if they wanted to dive deeper, they would have the option then of linking to to additional content. But but we use these content entry forms. Uh, we put real content into it, um, and then, again, hand it over to Dana. Yeah. Oh, and I, of course, skipped ahead. 
So now that we've had the tree test that kind of validated um, our findings, and actually I failed to mention this, we actually run our um, tree tests in pairs. We, um, at, at NIAD, we have been in the process of running two tests with the exact same task set so we can confirm they're better. That's why I was showing the two examples before. And what that tree test gave us at the end was confidence that our label and hierarchy was correct, which means if we reuse those tasks here or, um, or even just like have people looking at the same navigation structure, it'll be much more obvious to us during the course of a usability test what problems are being caused by the user interface as opposed to what's caused by the labeling and the structure that we did. Because if we had a high success rate in the tree test and all of a sudden it fails here, it means that there's probably something about our visual design that needs to be addressed. Um, so uh, these are, a, now I'm kind of curious about whether or not they'll play. But um, here's a couple Open of. Down, look oh. through it. Try to stay on. This I didn't game. realize. Down, look through it. Try to. Stay. You know what? Yeah, I'm not going to play with that out. audio there. Um, so these are a couple of examples of the types of artifacts we have. Because Kevin has uh, real content and those content entry forms, um, we. Uh, we use real content in the usability test. There is no lorem ipsum once we get to here because part of the objective of the usability test is to see if people can find and understand the content and answer our questions about it. So um, we do not design the website to have this column of text perfectly aligned with this image. We design the website to have people read our content and understand what NIA does in our organization. So. Um, we do that in a lot of different forms. Uh, we can use really lightweight prototypes. Uh, and actually, this video I can play because I know it doesn't have any sound. Um, which uh, will create interactive wireframes, which are very low fidelity. I can create on my own, not get a developer involved. Sometimes we do need to get developer help, um, but we try and uh, limit the scope of, of those projects to make the best use of their time. But on the right, you can see we needed a responsive uh, prototype here, and so we've also done usability testing on that to make sure that people can still consume this information on mobile devices. Yeah. And one of the great things about wireframes is, um, Dana was mentioning development, you can really get anyone that has some skin in the game about um, this, this architecture changing or their content being moved around, they can sort of see everything on these wireframes. Before it gets to the development, Dana can create something really lightweight like this. We can put real content in there. We can put it in front of stakeholders and decision makers um, and organizational leaders, and we can say, this is what your new website is going to look like. What do you think? Um, so before uh, you know, we go too far down to development, um, we've, got these, we've got these great tools. And it's a great tool, again, to hand off to the development team when we're talking about you know, this is what we're this is what we're trying to build here. And it's great for starting conversations with developer about the best way to build something. When you give them mock-ups, it seems a little too set in stone about what the uh, what things uh, need to be done or how things need to be done. So wireframes are helpful for saying this is the basics of it. Still sketch. Back to my tool, another spreadsheet. Uh, the content type definition. Um, this is what we're handing off to uh, the development team um, when they start creating. Uh, the different content blocks on, on the page level in Drupal. Um, it, it, it's kind of the next step from um, those content entry forms. We know what the blocks are. We know what we want. We can get a sense of how much content goes in each of these blocks. So, And we, we document this all in the content type definition where we can say, okay, these are the different blocks that are going to be on the page. Um, this is what they're called. This is whether they're required. This is how many characters are allowed within those blocks. Um, and, uh, and we just kind of fill out as much information as we can uh, and hand that off as one of the uh, one of the things that we give to the development team, along with the wireframes, um, and uh, actually not yeah. just wireframes, but annotated wireframes. Um, so a lot of these items uh, we end up creating either epics or user stories for. And basically, uh, we do deliver the full interactive wireframes to our developers, but this gives them a greater sense of, this is the feature I was going for, and this is the objective of it. Like, this is two sets of curated links here. And this is roughly what I had in mind. So um, this way, when we pass this over to the developers were like, okay, it's had a full vetting. The users like this, they can complete their tasks well, um, they can do them quickly, and so this is what's really important. And uh, 
that's it. So actually, um, I will say, we mentioned a couple of websites during this presentation. One was the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. It is constantly a work in progress, and, but we have made some significant changes to the IA. You can check it out there. Um, I also mentioned the tool that I used for card sorting and tree tests, Optimal Workshop. Links are there. And these slides have already been posted to, the, um, to our, uh, our speaker session page. The slides are available as a, as a PowerPoint. And um, my name is Dana Solano. And I'm Kevin McDermott. Um, you can contact us with our information there. We also have our, uh, our NIAD um, leaders in the room, which is uh, Tori Garden and Alice Litzinger. There's some in the back. There. Yeah, and if you have additional questions about NIAD and its web projects, they can answer questions for you. And if you need to know more about Drupal, uh, we also have a booth that uh, from Booz Allen Hamilton of people who know much more about Drupal than, for instance, I do. Um, and they can answer those questions. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, before we end, are there any questions anyone has? Yes, can you agree? Um, so one thing we've run into with our client is that they don't want to um, survey people because of OMB regulations. So when we've done testing, like tree jack testing, we've done it with like nine people, which has limited use. Um, I mean, it's better than nothing. But I'm just wondering how you get around that. Yeah, that is so, a great yeah. question for Tori Garten. So um, if you read the social media and some of the other PRA documents, the gender's interpretation, you'll see in there that there was actually a draft related to usability testing that was supposed to come out of another MMO that got circulated but never was published. So I actually contacted OIRA, I think it was the acronym, um, and asked them specifically about tree, tree jack. And um, they said we could use it because in the digital strategy, you're specifically told to get feedback and that kind of thing. Um, and so it's, it's the way you ask questions. You can only ask a certain number of open-ended questions, right? And it's certain data you collect about users. But big tree, because tree jack is they have options and they're not typing or something along those lines. There were, I can dig up the email, but if you want to contact me, um, I absolutely ask them about using these tools because it seems like a real limitation to have to do, you know, this every time. So, um, yeah, so I, I kind of just went down there and they could do it. It, it definitely goes to how you ask the questions and how many questions and then how you, how the responses are framed and has to open it or not open it. And most, actually, so none of our questions are personally identifiable in any way. Um, we ask for no information. All of the tests we run with the public are completely anonymous. And um, we ask questions that are, if they're open-ended, they're questions like, how satisfied? Or like, why, were you, why did you group the cards this way? And um, we'll also ask questions about like when it starts getting into maybe like job title, if we can switch over to like radio buttons to be like, I am a research scientist. None of these job descriptions uh, apply to me. Those kinds of questions so that way we kind of stay away from. Uh, we still yeah. want to be able to collect <laughs> enough data to segment it, but not collect so much that we could guess who they were. And the same applies to the card sort of optimal Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's a suggestion that there's a relation between the results of card sort and the questions that you came up with in Tree Jack. Is that correct? I mean, was that what informed how you decided um, to ask people about navigation? So typically, how we come up with the questions is. Uh, I wouldn't say that's necessarily based on the card sort. Um, the element that we might get out of the card sort is things that didn't really get a good home. We might specifically add a task then that's like, okay, we had people putting this you know, content all over the place. Like when we did the card sort, we better address that and figure out um, when we're actually validating the structure if people would really go there during a tree test. Um, so that's one way that it might do it, but it's usually based on other items, which is um, uh, where Could we do a task analysis of the users and we're like, what are the most common tasks that need to be done? Or uh, we have like feedback uh, on the website itself where people were often like complaining or contact NIAD looking for information. And so we use all of that to kind of drive our sure. task and scenario so design. So you have other vectors of collecting yes. user experience and data that ultimately lead to those. Oh, things. yeah. So actually at NIAD we have um, 
We have a lot. We have the site-wide survey. We recently added a was this page helpful tool that gives us page level data. Um, we have people contacting the, uh, we have a contact form on the website or an email box that's related to it. We, um, we've yeah, conducted user, user research and interviews. Um, Search results, just finding out what people are looking for. And kind and of I, I mean, we didn't get it all at once. We have our analytics data, yeah. but progressively over the last two years, we've been continuously adding to our supply of data that we can access um, to kind of help us figure these things out. And you also, we didn't mention this at the beginning when we were talking about doing that user research, but you also, uh, you're looking directly at the content and you want to understand what the, the mission of the site is, what the mission of the organization is when you're, when you're sort of analyzing the content and coming up with some of these questions. So um, that's a really important, uh, important thing to consider as well. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, what do you use to create those interactive wireframes? That one that I specifically showed was made with Axure, or a Azure. I don't know exactly sure how you pronounce it. A X U R E. Um, I'd probably update the slide deck with a link to that. It is a rapid prototyping tool. Um, I typically go with the lowest fidelity possible, but you can load it up with mockups and things like that, and it allows you to write like if-then statements, so that way you can make mega menus appear or emulate some of the more complex interactions. Um, it definitely doesn't produce code that you could give to a developer. Um, it is, uh, it just outputs something that is acceptable for usability testing. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, On the stairs? Wait, yeah. oh, apparently my pointing doesn't yeah. count. My website doesn't have um, consistently uh, topic landing pages, which is a little bit unconventional, but there are definitely usability advantages. Was that met with any resistance? Was that conscious, or how did you come about that? So, are you talking about the, the public website? Yes, the yeah. public website, so maybe you that So fun. things were sort of listed as topics originally, uh, and people got kind of got got used to seeing things as topics, but we looked at it and it was sort of topics was something that was just a grab bag that was just kind of everything. And so uh, we found that there was a lot of things that didn't necessarily fit uh, together. Uh, and we wanted to break that up a little bit. So this was, that was something that was really kind of difficult. We wanted to, we broke it down into um, what Tori had, had uh, brilliantly referred to as sort of the horizontal um, things that, that NIAD looks at, like the di individual diseases, and then the, the research that they do across different diseases. So we broke those up into different categories. So uh, to answer your question, you know, yes, there was pushback because people were used to seeing things like that. But um, go ahead, Dana. All right. When Kevin says there was pushback, he's talking about from the content owners as well. So yeah. there, there, we got pushback from different groups. So um, one of the interesting things about building out the public website's information architecture was one of the main things we wanted to do was make people understand that the institute was a research institute. And that's, that's what they did. Because a lot of people didn't understand that the NIAID website was one, not WebMD, and two, not the CDC, who uh, controls public health information. And so we broke it actually up by audience. And different audiences were interested in the diseases in different ways. So you're much more uh, public audiences, people interested in clinical trials or um, specific disease advocates wanted to see the diseases and conditions and just quickly jump to the one they had. Whereas you might have other groups like scientists or Congress who were more interested in the cross-cutting topics. And it was like what was applicable in all these different ways. So we had a lot of different ways to bring this content together that we tried to make work together. Um, and so... And it served the purpose yeah. of, you know, if you put everything in one bucket, it becomes overwhelming and people can't find what they're looking for um, and they get frustrated. So uh, that's why we wanted to break it up a little bit. And you're right, we, d we did break things up by again, um, organizational goals, which was that research, uh, and also uh, by the different audiences and what they were, how they were looking for the content. Yeah. Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about taxonomy, like how it's used mm -hmm. either by your teammates or by, you know, by Drupal? Yep. Um, Drupal does, uh, does have some great functionality with taxonomy. So um, you saw up there that, that um, we had uh, different pieces of content that can be tagged with, they're in different places in the site that can be tagged with, with um, that taxonomy. So what you can do when you, when, when I showed you the, the content entry form and I was breaking things up into blocks, what Drupal could do is they could take that intro block, for example, and, um, and so whatever it needs, like a title and a, and a intro block, pull those different titles and intro blocks from different pieces of content or content throughout the site, put it into like a collection page. Uh, so pull it all together, 
Uh, so if somebody's you know looking for um, everything to do with AIDS, they can pull it from different parts of the site. They can see the little snippets of information. They can quickly scan it and they can say, that's the thing I'm looking for. I want clinical trials. That's what I want to go to. And then jump off to that, that section of the site. So is it fair to say the health topics became your taxonomy? Yep. So it was, it was the diseases. It was the, the areas of research became another piece of taxonomy. We added a category for the different divisions within the organization because we knew that the internal, you, or the, the internal people in IAD were also users of the site. Uh, and they saw things in, in that way. Um, and then we added a couple other, uh, other categories, and, and we're constantly looking at the content and trying to see if there's taxonomy categories that we can add. Um, you don't want to get too crazy and, and break it up in so many ways that it just becomes meaningless, but um, you, you definitely want to be able to use it uh, and be able to manipulate that content and move it around and, and just kind of associate things with that taxonomy. Another, another good thing is related content, so on the intranet, um, you've got a piece of content and then uh, there might be other pieces of content um, that would be useful to a person on that page. And so you can use the taxonomy to, to create related content and say, you might also need this, that this might also be interesting. All right, that's actually uh, our presentation. It's 2.45 and I believe we have to, 2.46, and so I believe we have to clear out okay. this room. But um, Kevin and I are gonna head over to the Booz Allen uh, table. And if you wanna have a conversation with us, um, we're happy to continue there. Thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you.